Our speaker today is Chris Puglio. Chris has been a software developer at Send With Us since 2015. He is a mentor at Ladies Learning Code, a mentor and instructor at Lighthouse Labs, and the founder of Django Girls Victoria. Please welcome him for making a blazing fast Python server in the age of Node and Go. Oh man. Hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me near the, the uh, back of the room? Yeah? Right, I'll speak quieter just so you can't hear me. <laughs> uh, I kind of decided to just call it asynchronous Python because that's less of a mouthful. Uh, I am Chris Puglio. Uh, like um, Workday mentioned, I am a platform developer at Send With Us. And um, I teach thingies, I do back end thingies. Uh, I have half a degree from UVic that I'm currently finishing. Uh, that's an X, and I was lucky enough to hit the middle of it, which is great. I never did that again, so. This is Tintin, but with my face on it. It's like a running gag at Send With Us, so, you yeah, know, it's pretty normal. Uh, there's some contact info down there if you want to send me some memes or something. Uh, I work at Send With Us, and Send With Us was founded in January 2013. It's a little startup you might have heard of. <laughs> we put on this conference. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we we run a Django Python app on Heroku, and it gets about 25,000 requests a minute, and we send about a billion emails a month. And I get to work on some cool API stuff on that. I didn't know where to put this. But this is the repo of all the code I'm going to be showing you in examples. So if you want to take a look at that, it's all there. I have a cat. Uh, his name is Belarus. And he's a very good boy. <laughs> Any questions about the cat? <laughs> uh, Siamese. <laughs> yeah. All right, so before I get started, uh, I wanted to go over the agenda first. That's going to come after. Uh, is that a Better for Slido, or is it a quick kind of? Oh, it was just like, can you go back to the repository? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have made a Bailey link. It's moxuz slash startup slam 2018 performant python. If you just go to the moxuz and click on repository. Yeah, you'll find it in there if you go to moxuz. Cool. Uh, this is what I wanted to go over today. Uh, I wanted to talk quickly about generators, because that's going to be very important for what we cover later on. I want to talk about something called the GIL, uh, then concurrency, multiprocessing, and hopefully a live demo. We'll see what happens. This slide is out of order, but I want to do like a quick show of hands. Uh, if you've used Python and you know what a generator is, could you put up your hand? OK. A few people. It's great. Uh, who wants to tell me what a generator is? I'm going to point at someone if you don't. So. Yeah. It's an iterator that goes step by step as opposed to calculating everything all at once. Yeah, awesome. Great explanation. So that's kind of, I can do that. So now when I explain it, I'm like, oh, I can do it better because you just explained it really well. <laughs> so, yeah, so like Valerie mentioned, it's something that lets you iterate over values. So you know when you have a function, you can give it values and you can return a value once, right? Right. With a generator, you can actually yield a value more than once. So it's like returning, but you can do it, say, 100 times. And every time you do it, your function keeps its state. So if you had defined a variable there, when you yield and go back into the function, all your stuff is, is how you left it. And it can be used iterative, iter, iteratively. So if you write a for loop, you can go over a generator and do some actions every time it gives you a value. So here's a basic example of a generator. So I have a function called countdown. And it takes a number. While the number is greater or equal to 0, I am going to pass the number back to the caller. They can do whatever they want with it. And then when they ask me to keep going, I'm going to subtract 1 from it. So if I call my function and pass it 10, I'm going to keep whatever it gives me in count. Count is going to be of a type generator. So it's a special object in Python. And then what I can do is I can write a for loop. And what the for loop does for me in the background is it keeps telling countdown to give me the value and then 
move forward. So if I run this code, I'll get 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, down to 0, printed out. Uh, a little bit more on generators. Whenever you see a yield, uh, when you hit that, your code is suspended until, from the outside, you call something called next on it, which is what the for loop actually does in the background. And like I mentioned, a generator keeps function state, unlike a return, which is what we did here by decrementing number every time we called it. So if this was a function, that wouldn't really work, because number wouldn't remember what it was. Here's the same example, but without a for loop. So what I can do is make the generator again, but instead of making a for loop, I'm going to do it manually. So if I call next on the generator, it will go to the yield, it will give me the value, and then I can print it out. But then I say, hey, hit next again. It's going to run again until it hits the yield, then it's going to pause, and my outside code can run. So that's how I get the print 1098 down to zero. So this is the exact same thing as this for loop, but only run three times. Okay, uh, this is the same example, but I've got something else that's going to pop up soon. What's cool about generators that some people who have used generators sometimes aren't aware of is instead of just getting values out, you can actually send new data into a generator. So it, it's like a function that can continually give you data and you can keep passing values into. So unlike a regular function, which you pass value in, values in once and then you get values back once, you can do both of those multiple times. So here's an example where I give my multiplier generator a value m, and then I loop forever, and I say, hey, pass me in another value. So instead of just saying yield something, I'm saying yield, and then put whatever you give me into x, and then I'm going to yield m times x. So x equals yield means whatever you're giving me, I'm going to take, put in x, and then yield m times x means I'm giving you back this value. So I'm saying <coughs> store this function with the value 2 into multiplier. So m is going to be 2. Then I'm going to call next on it, which just means run until the next yield. I'm going to call dot send on it. So the number 1 is going to be sent into that, into x. And I'm going to print out what it gives me. And that's going to be 1 times 2. That's going to print out 2. I'm going to call next again, which is going to tell it, restart, run until you hit yield. Now I have to give you a value, because you're waiting for a value. The code is paused until I give you another value. I'm going to send 2. And then it's going to run, hit the yield 2 times 2. And I'm going to print that out, and it's going to give me 4. Uh, what are your questions so far? This can be kind of confusing. And I know. Slido is supposed to. So am I supposed There's to wait? For... On Slido okay. If you have any questions, feel free to post them to Slido. Yeah. So we already went over what is the VS Code theme you're using. Yeah, I'm using right? One Dark Pro. Okay. <laughs> oh, will these will the slides be available later? Yes, I'll post the slides in the repository. Okay. Vim plus Tmux or not worth the effort. I use Vim and Tmux. Okay. How do you unit test generators effectively, okay. and what's the test's complexity compared? To pure function. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, do you mind if I just sit yeah, up to us in the please. mic? Uh, May asks, how do you unit test generators effectively? What's the test complexity compared to pure functions? Yeah. Awesome question, May. Um, <laughs> it is much more complicated to unit test a generator because they keep their state. So you kind of have to either make a new one or try to remember what you had passed to it in the first place. Because otherwise, you might get some weird cases where you forgot what was in there, you're trying to test it, and then you thought you passed three, but you really passed 17, so now your values are wrong now. I think there was one more question about generators. Does the generator have to have a loop in it? Awesome. A generator, so the question was, does a generator have to have a loop in it? And the answer is no. So I could make this yield the number five like six times in a row, and it'll work exactly the same, but after that, it will raise an exception called stop iteration, and that tells you, hey, I'm out of data. So when you write a for loop on the outside to go through all the values, it will uh, natively see that exception and just say, oh, your for loop's done. But if you're doing it manually and you get to the end, you have to try catch the stop iteration exception, which tells you that you're out of data in there. So no, you don't have to have a loop in a generator. One more question. 
Okay. And then I'll move forward after that. Yeah. How are generators different or similar than pure functional programming? Uh, how are generators different or similar to pure functional programming? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not an expert on functional programming, but I think with generators, you can do something called currying, which is what this would be an example of, where you say you have a function that takes two arguments. You can give it one argument. You get a function back that is half finished, and you can use that by giving another argument. Like if you're mapping over a list, you can say, hey, keep doing this with this one argument, and I'm going to give you a new one every time. Um, I'd recommend Googling that later, because that was probably a very strange <laughs> example I just gave. Cool. Thanks for the questions. All right. This is going to be a weird example. I didn't really know how to show this, but what I'm doing here is I have a generator that's going from 1 to 10, and it's printing out the value it gets from the outside, and it's also giving you a value. Then out here, forever, I am printing out what I get from that generator and then passing in the number 1. So if I run this, at, the f at first, <laughs> it will send 1 into there. So it will print from generator 1. Then it will send data back to the outside. So now I'm in the print from user line. It will say from user 2. Then I will send data back in. So I'll say from generator 1, because I'm always sending the number 1. Send data out from user 3, and I'll just keep going forever. And that's, that uses something called context switching. So that's, that means uh, switching between like, different functions or different lines of code like iterative, iteratively like that. So that's called context switching. And that will be useful in a little bit. Something really cool you can do with generators is put generators in generators. So, like, whoa, I heard you like generators. So, uh, let's focus on the left side first because that's like just, whoa, you can do it differently. On the left here, I have two generators. I have reader, which is pretending to read from like a database or something, but all it's doing is going from like one to four, giving you back a string that's just arrow, arrow, a number. Then I have another generator that just goes through every value in the generator you give it. Then it just gives it right back to you. So it's kind of useless. But where that comment is, you could pretend it's doing some logging or it's doing some business logic. You could do anything in there. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying make reader. So I'm going to make the generator by invoking it like a regular function. I'm going to pass it as a value, which is something you can do in Python if you're unaware, into reader wrapper. So g is going to be a generator, and then I'm going to store that value in wrap. So wrap now holds a generator that has a generator in it. Then I'm just going to go through every value in wrap, which is just going to print out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So there's a bit of a cleaner way of doing that by using something called yield from. It's a new keyword in Python 3.3, I think, or 3.5, but it lets you just yield a generator from a generator and just give it as if you were giving the values yourself. So you don't have to loop over it and then pass them back. You say, hey, this generator knows what it's doing. Just assume I'm giving you this generator. And on the outside, you can just loop through it like you were doing before. So it just makes it a little bit simpler. But that's not all it does. Let's say I want to write. So I've got, once again, two functions. I've got writer and I've got writer wrapper. They do the same thing, but the opposite. They are passing data in. And then writer is now printing out. So like I mentioned earlier, you have to try catch the stop iteration exception, because that tells you, hey, I'm out of data. You got to stop going over my stuff. Um, I also have to pass in data to this writer wrapper, and then do g.send into there. So let's say I have code on the outside using this. I would need to do dot send on that generator. In here, I have to take the value from yield, like we were doing earlier when we were printing between those two generators. Then I've got to send it into writer. So that's really gross. What if we could just do that? We can. What? <laughs> yeah, so yield from is awesome. It handles everything. So if you want a generator being used by another generator, you should consider using yield from. All right, so this is going to kind of lead us into concurrency, because generators are how Python concurrency work. So I want to start off by talking about what concurrency actually is. So it very 
like 10,000 feet up just means being able to perform multiple tasks at the same time, but not necessarily running at the same time. You can kind of go between them, work on each of them a little bit, but they're all kind of working uh, at the same time. Yeah. Uh, concurrency can use something called threads or processes, which is kind of an OS level thing, but you can say like a thread is maybe some sliver of my program I want to run kind of asynchronously. Like I don't want to really care about it, so I'm going to say, hey, this thread can go do whatever it wants. This other thread can go do whatever it wants, and I'm going to do something else. A process is similar, but for like a, like a whole Python program. A process can have multiple threads, and we are going to do a demo of this a little bit later. So how does Python handle this? Like Python's kind of famously slow and famously single-threaded, which is kind of hard to imagine. Like how do you do multi-threading in Python if it just works on one thread? And uh, we are going to talk a little bit more about that now. Uh, imagine a chess exposition. You know that thing where you have like one chess master than like 20 people, and like she's just wrecking everyone, right? So this is my beautiful diagram of a chess exposition. These are the chess boards, and she's the grandmaster. And what we could do is say, hey, you're going to play your game against this person first. He doesn't know chess very well, so he's going to take about an hour to finish. Then you're going to move to the next person, do that again. And at the end, maybe you took five hours, because there's five people to play against. So she knows her opponents are going to take more time, because she's really good. They're OK. So what if she could play all of the games at once, but do one turn on each game, like one after another? And that's how a chess exhibition works. So she's going to play her turn, move to the next person, do her turn, keep moving like that. And by the time she gets back, hopefully he has decided what to do, right? Maybe it's a really tricky move, but it's going to be faster than just waiting. And this is exactly what concurrency is. It's not making your program run faster somehow. It's making your program use its time better. So it's not waiting for the opponent to make their move. It's going to do something else. It's managing its time better. And this is actually an example of something called an event loop. All of these games are events, and she's looping over them and working where she can. Obviously, she can't do work on an opponent who hasn't actually made his turn yet. So something pretty famous to Python is called the global interpreter lock. It's the GIL for short. And this is what forces Python to be single-threaded, and is what a lot of people don't like about Python, because it kind of forces Python to be slow if you don't know what you're doing. So let's think about when Python was created. It was made in the early 1990s. And at that point, multi-cores and multi-threads weren't very popular. It wasn't until like 2005 that like gaming consoles got that. So in 1992, the creator of Python was like, OK, maybe we should consider this to future-proof the language. So how can we add threading to Python? We have something like global variables in Python. Like, what if two threads are trying to use the same data? Like, what do we do? So one thing we could do is, well, actually, this is an example of what the problem is. So in Python, every time you initiate a variable, in the background, there'll be a reference of how many people are using that variable. So if I have two threads, both using an object, the object will have a number two on it. And when that gets down to zero, Python knows, hey, you're not using this anymore. I'm just going to get rid of it. That saves memory. So you know when you call a function, you give it a variable, it does some work, and it returns? That function isn't using that variable anymore. It can just be deleted. What happens if you have two threads that both say, hey, I don't need this value anymore? Let's say thread one doesn't need the value anymore, so it's going to dereference it. It's going to reduce it from two to one. So it takes the object and says, oh, there's two. But at the exact same time, thread two wants to do that as well. So it takes the object and says, oh, there's two. Both of them change it to one and then save it. Well, that doesn't really work because it should have gone down by two, but because they were doing it at the same time, now it's gone down by one. So that would give us a memory leak. Or what about the opposite, where two threads make an object, but it thinks only one of them is using it. So when one of them stops using it, it deletes the object, and then the other thread is just like, I have to crash. I don't have this data anymore. So this is the issue facing Python. How could we solve this? Well, what if we do something called locking? What if on each object, you put a lock 
And if you want to modify it, you have to set a value on that lock that says, hey, I'm using this. Nobody else can touch it. Then you do your stuff. Then you unlock it. That could solve it. But what happens if you have two objects with two locks, and both threads want to modify these objects? Let's say thread one takes object A and locks it. At the same time, thread two takes object B and locks it. And then both of them want to talk to the other object. So thread one is now saying, hey, I'm going to wait until lock B is unlocked, because I want both of these, and I want to do some work on them. And thread two is saying, I'm going to wait for, one, uh, for lock A to be unlocked, because it wants to work on both of them. Well, neither of them are ever going to be unlocked, because they're both waiting for the other thread's lock, right? This is called deadlocking. So that is an issue of just adding locks everywhere. What if we could just make one lock? and put it at the top of the Python process. If you want to run Python code, you have to set a value on this lock saying, hey, I'm running Python, and then you can run your code. This is what the global interpreter lock is. Instead of putting a lock on every variable, you have one lock in your entire program. And if to even run Python, you must have that lock. This is nice because it's easy to understand, and it makes the interface with C, the language C, very easy. So this lets people write exten extensions for Python very easily, which is great, because if you think, oh, my Python's too slow, I'm going to write some of it in C, and then I can just import that into Python, it's great. So if your program is I.O. bound, which means you're making a lot of network requests, which can take a second, two seconds, you don't want to wait while that's happening, right? This is great, because while that's happening, Python knows you can't be executing Python code if you're waiting for a request. So it says, I'm going to go do something else. But for CPU-bound programs, where you're slowed down by just how fast you can execute uh, variables, this is bad, because you can't just start a new thread and have two of them executing variables at the same time. It turns out the Gil actually had a big issue before Python 3.2, which is where threads would almost never give up the lock. So even if you made five threads to try to make your program faster, you'd end up making it like five times slower, which is kind of silly. So the too long didn't listen to me is Python was created when multicores weren't really a thing. Well, why can't we just remove it, right? That's because uh, someone's been trying to remove it, but it actually turns out it makes Python like four to seven times slower on the base C Python. So it's like, oh, I'm going to use multi-threading in my program. Oh, it's going to be seven times slower. G great. <laughs> What's interesting is Python, the language, is actually built on multiple different implementations. So the base one you've probably used at UVic or at your work is on C Python. And that has the gil because you're interfacing with C. There are a few others like Jython, Iron Python, and PyPy, which don't have to interface with C, and they don't actually have a gil. They can run multiple Python processes at the same time. That's because they have more control over how they manage their garbage collection. Because if you ever change that, anyone who's made C extensions for your code, it all breaks. So if you want to change that every two months, then everyone's going to be mad at you. So these three don't have to deal with that, because they just say, you can't write extensions for this. And they allow you to uh, do multi-threading, where they, uh, each thread runs at the same time. Why don't Java, Go, Rust, C++, why don't they have a guild? That's because they don't have to interface with C, because they're considered fast enough. Someone mentioned that removing the guild would probably mean removing the C extensions API. Because if you remove it, like I said, every time you want to change the back end of how Python works, everyone who's written code for the C API, it just breaks. Are there any questions so far? I'm kind of just charging through this. I'm going to take a moment. There are a couple. Um, one question around how can there be an object patching conflict if it's single threaded and you won't always want to first? Yeah. So the question was how can there be a deadlock or an issue with two threads messing with the other object if Python is single-threaded. Well, that's just it. Python is single-threaded because of that issue. When this was being considered, uh, the creator of Python was thinking, OK, what if we make it not single-threaded? Uh, this problem can arise, so let's make it single-threaded. So it is single-threaded because of this issue. And one more. Uh, if running generators, are there OS-dependent quirks for concurrency? Differences in how Python handles generator threading in Windows versus yeah, a POSIX system, yeah. There absolutely is 
a difference between how you can do concurrency in Python between Windows and Linux. Uh, it's not necessarily generator specific, but it's something we'll be looking at later, which is threading specific. So I'm kind of like bashing threads here, but we're going to do a threading example later. There's absolutely a difference. On Linux, it uses native POSIX threads. And on Windows, I have no idea what it does. <laughs> it, it does some magic. I don't know. There's C sharp in there somewhere. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, a good thing about a, so the question is why might one use a generator? The good thing about a generator is you can pause the execution of the code to go do something else. But also, say you want to load six billion lines of a text file into your program. If you did it normally, you'd take the whole file and put it into a huge list, and your memory would be huge, right? For a generator, you could say, every time I ask for one, just go get the next line. So now you're only ever storing one line of the six billion at a time. That saves a lot of memory. All right, cool. Uh, here's my cat again. <laughs> he likes to sleep with his mouth open so you can see his little teethies. Yeah. All right, so now that I've been saying Python is single threaded and there's a gil, and the title of this talk is Asynchronous Python. Like, how does that work? So, like the chess master, she's going between games. You still use one thread at a time, but you just decide where you want to do your work. And that's once again called context switching. When you're going from one function to another to go do some other work. And there's actually an issue with that, where every time you context switch, you go do something else, you lose caching on the, on the CPU. So the CPU is a small amount of memory where it can put stuff in there that's really quick to access. Every time you switch between threads, that cache is broken. And then if you want to go back to that code, what's well, going to be a bit slower the first time. So there's an issue with that, where if you want to add like 200 threads to your program, you might make it really slow because of that. OK, so just like when the chess master is waiting for her opponent to make a move, that's blocking, right? She can't do anything at that point. So she's going to go work on something else. So that's how switching between threads works. Let's say you're writing to a file or you're talking to a server, which might be super slow. During that time, Python knows that process isn't running anymore. It's blocked. So it doesn't need the global interpreter lock. I'm going to go do something else and then come back to it later. When it's done, an event will fire telling Python, hey, I'm good to go. And at some point, it'll go back there and finish up the code. So like I mentioned, switching between different threads is slow, but it's much faster than waiting for input-output. A server could take a second, which is crazy, or like, a nanosecond when you're just switching between contexts. So that's way better. So I've been talking about event loops, with the example being the chess master. Switching between games, switching between threads is an event loop, because you're looping between what you want to work on. And they can be built in two different forms. You can make something called a callback event loop, or something which uses futures. So you remember when I made the, that generator that took another generator? I was passing it in as a, as a value. You can do that in Python. And that's how you make callbacks. You say, hey, function, here's some data. And here's a function I want you to call later when you're done. When it's finished its work, it'll just, uh, it'll just call that function. Or you can use futures, which is where anything that's synchronous, that will be slow, immediately returns. But it gives you a variable that's promising it will be filled with data in the future at some point, And you have to wait on it to be ready. So we're talking about concurrency. And going between threads and going between work is called using a coroutine. You can use a coroutine to do that. And what's cool is thinking back to when we had generators, we can make a coroutine with a generator. Because we can do work, then we can pause the execution, the caller can do some work. Then we can go back in there, and we can even send data back in there. So this is an example of a coroutine. And let's say slow is a function that takes like 20 seconds. What I can do is say yield from slow, which means anything outside of it can now do its work. And then when it's done, Python will give me the data, and then I can print it out. So this is a basic example of a coroutine. And there's a lot of magic ways to do this in Python 3. But before Python 3, in the dark ages, we had to use 
some libraries called like gevent or tornado or uh, twisted. So gevent was a really easy way to use threading and concurrency in Python 2. It does something really scary where when you import it, you tell it to patch the standard library, which means it modifies the Python standard library to become asynchronous. So it changes the base code of Python. And you can just call it by saying dot patch all, and it's really scary. Um, it gives you something called a greenlet, which is like a thread. It's a very lightweight thread. And you can say, hey, I want you to do these 10 requests in 10 greenlets at the same time. They all actually run in one thread, but they switch between, between them using an event loop, like I mentioned earlier. And you can use greenlets to perform uh, non-blocking I.O. So here's a GVN example. I have two functions, foo and bar. All they do is print something out and then sleep for zero seconds. And then they print something else out. So you can pretend that sleep is like doing a network call. So what I'm going to do is spawn two uh, greenlet threads by using gevent.spawn. I'm going to pass it the function, but I'm not calling the function. I'm just saying, hey, do this later. So that's actually a callback. And then I'm going to say, hey, gevent, run all these threads, and then just when they're done, that's good. You can stop. So I'm going to get out, I'm in foo, and then it pauses, and gevent has got other stuff to do than wait for you. So it's going to go to the other thread, say I'm in bar, then it pauses. So it goes back to the first one, end of foo, then end of bar. So it's kind of jumping between them. It's context switching between these two threads. And you can see how this would make your code faster if you're doing network calls. So instead of waiting for the first one to complete, you do both of them at the same time. Uh, OK, so what if we need to do 2,000 of these like, G event requests? Why don't we just do like 2,000 of them at once? Well, there's the problem of context switching, which would be really slow. But there's <laughs> a lot of times a program will actually just crash because that's just too much. So how do we do 2,000 if we can't do them all at once? Well, we can say do 2,000 in chunks of 100. So when this is done, do another chunk, do another chunk. And you can use something called a semaphore for that. And a semaphore is kind of like a lock, but you can say, hey, I want to do this. Do I, is there space for me to do this? Yeah, there's 99 other spaces. You can do it. And then 99 other ones can get the lock. But then at like 101, uh, you've got to wait. Um, I actually want to do a live demo of this. We'll see how it goes. Uh, let's just see where I am. Is that big enough? Can you see that in the back? Uh, let me make it a bit bigger. OK, that's big. OK, so I've made a simple Golang server running in the cloud. <laughs> yeah, it's up in the cloud. It's actually running in Docker if you've gone to the Docker talk. And all it does is take your request. Uh, when you make a request to it, you give it any number, and it will just sleep for that number of milliseconds. Then it will just return. So I call it with like 1,000. It will sleep for a second and then just return. Say, like, here's some data. That's actually what it gives you. Uh, I've made a program that makes hundreds of requests with a random number between 1 and 1,000. And we're just, we'll just see uh, how that works. So let's go into, let's go into gevent basic. Uh, nope, not that one. Go to gevent requests. All right, so here is some gevent code. At the top, I'm just, uh, is this big enough at the back? I know these colors are weird, but I haven't made my vim awesome. So at the top here, I'm just importing my libraries, and then I'm calling the infamous monkey.patchall, which means, hey, go change the entire standard library to do whatever you want. And that's how gevent works in the background. Uh, I've got an IP to my server, and please don't Kill it. <laughs> Hopefully it's too small and too red for you to see that. <laughs> then I've got uh, a main function, a function called download, which actually makes a network call. It's not really downloading anything. It's just freezing until the server gives you back a value. And then I've got something called build URLs. What that does is I just give it a number of URLs I want. It just gives me that number of URLs back slash the number between 1 and 1,000. And that's giving the server a random number to sleep on. So in my, 
I'll just go down a bit. So in my main function, uh, this is called a uh, list comprehension. It's like a for loop, but just in one line. So I'm saying, hey, spawn the number of threads equal to the number of URLs I get, and I want 200 URLs. So I'm going to make 200 threads, making requests to 200 different URLs, which is just a call to my server with a random number to sleep on. And then I want you to run all of those. So gevent.join all means this list of greenlets, run them all. And in this case, I'm not doing anything special, so they're all going to run at the same time. And then I'm printing how long it takes. So let's run that. Uh, gevent request.py. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Uh, sorry about that. Let me just. Uh, what is it called? 2018. Okay, let's now let's run that. Okay, so I just sent 200 requests to a server in about a second and 24 somethings. I'm really tired right now. So, yeah. So I just sent 200 requests, and if I do it again, it's going to be a different time because I'm sending a random sleep. Eh, it's very similar. It's probably some overhead to just making the threads that puts a, like this base 1.2 something. But I want to show you how slow that would be if I did it in serial, so synchronously, one after another. So let's go out to where I have, I think it's base.py. Yeah, OK, so I'm going to run the same thing. And it's just making 10 calls. But this should be really slow, unless they all say do a one millisecond sleep. Uh, that's invalid syntax. This is probably Python 3. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. No. Uh, I don't think so. I was just using Python before that was introduced. OK, so now it's running. So it's getting HTTP 200. That was a good request. Cool. And this is just 10 requests. That took six seconds. I just did 201.2 seconds. So that's really slow. That's awful, right? So that shows you how sweet, uh, 20 minutes left, how sweet Gevent is, or concurrency is. Uh, oh, I want to do the demo with a semaphore. So let's say I want to do 10,000 requests. It's not a great idea to do all of those at the same time. So let me show you how you can do it using a semaphore. Um, request pooling. So it's very similar code. But right before I make all my threads, I make something called a pool. And I pass it 100. That means you can take as many threads as I give you, but you're only going to let me do 100 at a time. Then I call all requests. But instead of doing gevent.spawn, I'm doing pool.spawn, p.spawn. So I'm doing 500 and 100 at, a t 100 at a time. So let's just run this real quick, depending on where it is. Pi, pi 2? Yeah, OK, where is this? Python request. Pooling. All right. Uh, that's running. It took about four seconds to do 500. But that's because it can't do more than 100 at once. It's waiting on that. And remember, 100 took about a second. So I'm doing 500. It's about four to five seconds, because I'm doing 100 at once. Yeah, is this, a, is this good for Slido, or is it a real quick? Uh, well, it's just like regarding this pool. What, what, why would you want to use pooling rather than just giving them all at once? So that's a good question. Why would you rather? use a pool than just do it all at once. Uh, if you remember back to when I talked about context switching, if you have 10,000 requests, you're actually not going to be able to, so remember it's single threaded, right? So you have one chess master trying to go between each game. At one point, you're going to have some time after a request is done where you're just waiting for the thread to come back and give you some time because it's starting to slow down. So if you have more than, I've seen about like 500 requests, kind of starts to slow down. You're not going fast enough to go back to it before it's finished. Does that kind of answer your question? 
we actually ran into this at Send With Us. We had a beefy server that could accept 1,000 threads at once using gevent. And we actually made it like three times faster by just saying, hey, just take 100. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but once you understand it, it makes sense. All right, so this was a demo of gevent, which is just one of the libraries you can use. This is the same code you just saw, but in this gross picture. <laughs> and that's using futures, which means, hey, here's the value right away, but it's not quite there yet. I promise I'll give you some values later. There's another one called Tornado, which is made by Facebook, and it uses a callback event loop, which means I give each function another function I want it to call once it's finished. Uh, Tornado actually runs everything in generators, and what's funny about a generator is you can't before Python 3 something, you can't just return a value. You always have to use yield. So how do you, how do you tell Tornado you're finished running your generator? You have, to, you have to throw an exception, and in the exception is your value. It's, it's, it's really weird. You raise an error containing data. Uh, I don't think we have time for me to run this locally, so I'm just going to show you. This is pretty much the same thing, but in Tornado. And uh, as you can see here, I have to raise generator.return value equals responses. So that, yeah, it's a bit strange. And this is in Python 2 something. So this is how to do concurrency before Python 3 dot something or other. So why do you use Tornado versus gevent? Or gevent versus Tornado? What's nice about Tornado is if I go back here, you can see down here I'm saying, hey, Tornado, I want you to run this function, run func. And this happens to be my main function. So Tornado is actually running my entire program. And that means it can do some smart stuff in the background to make your program a little bit more efficient. Uh, Gevent doesn't do that. So it can't quite get the efficiency that Tornado can get. But you don't have to have it running your whole program. You don't have to raise exceptions all the time. So Tornado is really good for I.O. bound uh, servers. And Gevent is better for programs that need to do some requests every once in a while, but you don't want Tornado running your entire app. You don't want gevent doing everything. Uh, so as of Python 3.4, we have something awesome called async IO, which isn't a third party library like gevent or Tornado. It's built into the library, uh, to the standard library. It's a bit lower level than both those libraries, but these two libraries actually still exist in Python 3, and they use this under the hood. Ooh, that's, mm. Can you kind of see the yield from in there? Kind of? OK, so this is the same code. But every time I do something blocking, I'm going to call yield from, which means all this code is using generators. Because yield from says, hey, that's going to do something. The caller can keep working on stuff until this is finished. So I've just got yield from everywhere in there. That's kind of verbose, right? What if we could just write async await? And that's actually exactly what you can do in Python 3.5. So everywhere I say await would actually be yield from before that. So this is kind of like in a newer version of JavaScript. You can have an async function. And then any time you know you're going to have to wait for something to complete, you just say await. And then like Tornado, async IO runs your entire application. So when you are waiting for something, it knows to go work on something else. Uh, I wanted to do more demos for concurrency, but I have a multiprocessing demo I want to do later, and I don't think I have time for both. So that's the end of concurrency for now, uh, kind of like using threads. I want to talk about multiprocessing, which is where you can do CPU-bound programs faster. So remember when I said Python can only do one thing at a time? I was actually kind of lying. You can make Python run, say, four different Python processes at the same time and give you data back. Um, what's great about this is if you use a new process, it has its own Python interpreter, has its own GIL, which means there's no issue of both of them running at the same time. They can't talk to each other unless you, you use something called like a queue, which gives data to it in a safe way. So there's no issue with locking or like dereferencing stuff. So, it might sound complicated to do this, but it's actually pretty straightforward to spawn a new process. What you can do is just import process, 
and then have a function and say, hey, run this in a different process, and then just call start and join. And I can pass it data. So this is going to run, hello, Bob. What's cool about this is now we have two Python processes, so like two Python programs running at the exact same time, and um, you can use this to try to make your CPU bound programs faster, because what if you have to do like huge computation? You could do this in like five different steps on five different cores, and it hopefully will finish faster. Not always. Um, how do I make two processes talk to each other, right? Like if I spawn the second thing that can't interact with my variables, how do I give it data and get data back from it? I can use something called uh, IPC, which is inter-process communication, which is these two processes talking to each other. So I can just import a queue, make the queue, pass the queue as the variable like I did Bob, and then in that function running in another process, I can just call queue.put, so many strings. On the outside, I run queue.get, and then it'll print out so many strings. So once again, we have two Python processes running at the exact same time, <coughs> passing data between them. And it's actually pretty simple to do. Oh, one thing that's really cool is uh, pickling. Let me just get a pickle in there. <laughs> Whenever I pass data between processes on a queue, I need to do something called pickling. And that means taking this Python object and turning it into something I can give to another process. So like turning it into just like text, right? So if I pass these strings back, Python needs to take those strings, turn them into text that the OS can see, take it, give it to my next process. And the process has to take that weird text and turn it into an object. And that's called pickling. And that actually takes quite a long time. There's a lot of overhead to that. So if you try to make a program run faster by just putting two processes and giving a lot of data between it, it'll actually sometimes run slower because if you're just passing one number at a time, it needs to do that whole process where you pickle it and then de-pickle it, and that can take quite a lot of time. So let's look at a multiprocessing example where we have to calculate prime numbers. Are there any questions so far? OK, I should slow down there. So there's a couple that are around comparing Go to Python and why you choose Python instead of Go. And how does the multiprocessing and concurrency methods compare awesome. to Python and Go? Cool. Uh, so there's a question about how does Go's concurrency compare to Python's concurrency. <coughs> What's awesome is I'm actually a Go developer now. So I'm kind of looking back to when I did Python. And in Go, you can create a whole new thread that runs at the exact same time by just saying Go and then your function. And I always found that super easy. And I thought, whoa, Python must be so much harder. But like, it's really not that difficult to do. And in Go, you have something called channels, which is how you pass data between uh, Go routines. And here we have queues, which is how we pass data between different processes. So it's actually really similar, but Go is faster. Because it doesn't have to do that pickling as badly as Python does. Uh, I would write something in Python instead of Go if I wanted to run it quickly, or I didn't want to look at pointers again ever. Yeah. Uh, which window manager are you using? Uh, I'm using a chunk WM and Tmux in my terminal. And I use K KHD to change between windows. Okay. If you use Vim and Tmux, why VS Code? Uh, that might be a bit better for later. OK. <laughs> In your base.py, the program was waiting for a 200 status code. Is, this, is the pooling program also waiting for the 200 response code, or is it just executing the requests and not checking for return status? Cool. So the question was, does the pooling code actually look at what the, what the request status was after the request? Um, let's see. No, all it's doing is making the request. But I could change this to print out the 200 if you want. Or you could trust me and say, yeah, it is giving you back a 200. Uh, there wouldn't be any difference in speed here, really. OK, I'm going to move forward with this example. Uh, I do this at work all the time. You know, I need to know what numbers are primes, because we send email. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is an algorithm to solve primes, apparently. Uh, if you're a math major, maybe you've seen that, maybe not. Uh, here you can see that it's telling me which numbers are primes and which numbers aren't. So that's great. 
let's calculate like 10 billion primes using this. So it's probably pretty apparent that if we just did one number at a time for like 6 million numbers, it would be pretty slow. What if we used a queue, then had a bunch of processes eating off that queue, doing the calculation, and passing the data back to me, right? I'm splitting up the work. Why don't we do that? So I've got two queues here, one for like an output, one for an input. And I can see my Python program will just take a bunch of data, put it into that queue, and I'll just have any number of consumers, each getting a number, checking if it's prime. If it is, it gives it back to me, and I can say, hey, I found a prime. Well, OK, that's pretty cool. Uh, how about we see how that works? So I've got, um, just make sure. I've got a program here, which is literally just that algorithm. It takes two queues. Like the illustration showed, one queue is the numbers coming in that might be primes. One queue is the numbers coming out that are primes. So what is prime is going to do is going to check if something's prime. And if it is, it's going to put it on that finished queue. I also have some code in there that checks if what I'm getting from the queue is something called a sentinel or a poison pill, which means like, hey, actually, you're supposed to die now. So if it gets something called like flag finished, it just dies. It's done. So what I'm doing down here is I'm just making two queues. I'm going through uh, one, one to four and just making four processes, because I have four cores on this computer. I'm saying run that function that I just talked about and give it these two queues. And in between the range, like I think that's 10 million and something else that's big, put all those numbers on there and then put a bunch of values saying, hey, you can die now. And that's how we terminate our processes. And then I'm going to just wait until I get all my values back. I don't think I have time to run this, but this on my computer took about 90 seconds. Uh, what's funny is doing it without these four processes, just on one thread, I think took me 60 seconds. That's weird. This took 50% longer than just doing it synchronously. It's like, what's the point of quad core threading if I can't make it go faster. That's because of the pickling I talked about earlier. Every time I pass a number in there, I have to turn it into some kind of text, pass it to the process. It needs to take that, turn it into a Python object. Then it can work on it and then do the opposite. That takes a long time. So what if we could somehow only put numbers in there that we knew would be hard to calculate? Like we knew the program would be slow, so we can give that to someone else, a different process, then we can keep going over smaller numbers. So what I've got here is the exact same code, but before I put anything onto that first queue, I just check really quick if it's divisible by any number between 3 and 21, because that should be really fast to check. And by doing that, I save a whole lot of time, because I don't have to put those numbers. It will take almost no time to compute. I don't have to pass those pickle them, depickle them, wait for the response. I'm doing that right here. Uh, this ran in about 19 seconds. So that's three times faster than the fast version, which was just serial, and like four times faster than the same thing, but with every number being passed in. So that demonstrates how passing values can actually really slow down your program. I had another demo I wanted to give but I don't think we have time. So I think I'm going to end it there with the concurrency and multiprocessing stuff. And I think we have a few minutes for some more questions. Does it end at 30 or? If, if there are questions, go ahead. But I also have door prizes. And okay, I will there's quickly. There's nothing else in here, but maybe in the room. Anybody? I think someone was asking me, why do I use Vim and Tmux if I use VS Code? Uh, actually, I have the Vim key bindings to VS Code. So I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, someone asked for an interlanguage demo. I could show you my Golang server if you want, but it's not very exciting. So that's, that's some Go there. Um, 
Does anybody have any questions that aren't in Slido? Not all at once, like whoa. <laughs> no questions? Oh yeah, right there. Are your slides up somewhere? Uh, I will put them into the repository that is at this link in like five minutes. And there's also a few other demos in the repository I didn't have time to go over. So if you want to look at those, they're in there. Yeah? What's the moral of the story? Learn multi-threading in Python or just learn Go? Yeah, so should I bother with this or just learn Go? I think after seeing it's actually pretty quick to spin up a new process and to use a queue, I would consider using Python instead of using Go because you can actually make it very fast and you don't have to worry about pointers. <laughs> so if you want to write something that's similar to C, then you can go right ahead. But I really like the libraries in Python, so I, I tend to like writing Python for my side projects. But the moral of the story is Python can actually use threads, make asynchronous I.O. calls, run other Python processes at the exact same time, just like Go does with Go routines and channels, and actually find out prime numbers pretty quickly. So yeah. I think we should probably do door prizes now. Sure. Well, first, let me give you our thank you gift. Thank you for speaking. Oh, I thank you.